Welcome to Mazandercast, a Persian podcast about myth, magic, and mastochiar. I am your co-host, Sarah. And I'm your other co-host, Seth. We're glad you're here with us for another episode, so get your tea. Or your coffee. Maybe some snacks while you're at it. And let the adventure begin. I am so excited for today's episode, Seth, because we're finally getting to start reading the Shahnameh. I am so pumped. I'm also excited. It's been giggling to yourself uh, for the past week while we've been making, uh, while we've been doing research for this episode. There, there's so, some pretty ridiculous stuff. I'm, I'm interested to see what you've been reading. <laughs> so we'll only do a couple of chapters today. And then what I'd like to talk about afterwards is I'd actually talk, like to talk about the ancient Persian re religion Zoroastrianism. Okay. Because a lot of the people and the gods and the beings that are in the Shahnameh are based off of the Zoroastrian religion. Um, I don't know how accurate it is to original Zoroastrian stories and whatnot, but what I do have, they're praying to Ahura Mazda, which is the Zoroastrian version of God. Ahura. Ahura. Like the character on Star Trek? I don't, I don't, I don't watch Star Trek. I'm more of a Star Wars girl. You and I literally watched all of Star Trek together. Oh, that's true, but I, I watched it for the sake of watching uh, it. You, you've mentioned this a couple times. I, it's probably not related, but there's a character in uh, the original Star Trek series okay. named Lieutenant Ahura. Oh, oh, Ahura. You know what? Ahura. I, I don't know. Maybe. Of course, she is not Persian. She was she's Swahili. Not, she's not Persian, and she's not very much a, a celestial being. Well, it depends on what you see as a celestial being. She'll always be an angel to me. Ah, oh, well, this is God we're talking about here. Okay, yeah, I guess that's different. God goes by many names. In the Zoroastrian religion, he was Ahura Mazda. Uh, I guess in an American accent, you'd say Ahura Mazda. <laughs> I guess I'll let you do that. You can drive my Ahura Mazda all, oh the, my way God. The, all the way down to the Kroger. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Pick up some dog food and some cigs for me and your cousin. <clears throat> yeah, that southern accent of yours. The opposite of Ahura Mazda is, of course, the Satan version of Zoroastrianism, and he's called Ahriman. Ah. Ahriman. There's no ch in this one. There's no ch sound. That sounds like a Digimon. Ah, Ahriman. 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 Ah, no, no phlegm, right? No phlegm. Don't ah phlegm. <laughs> Ahriman. Oh, God. This is giving me flashbacks to that Prince of Persia game I tried to play. I, I, could, I couldn't do it. Just the way they pronounce things just made me cringe. Anyways, right. we are getting off, off subject. Topic, right. So, the religious figures, of course, main god is Ahura Mazda. We'll say Ahura Mazda so that everybody can handle that. Hmm. And Satan is Ahriman, which I think is easy for you to say. But these are the terms we'll stick with for now before we get started on the Shahnameh. So, for anyone who has picked up the book and is reading along, you've already read the first couple chapters, so uh, let's get into it because Seth isn't as uh, knowledgeable about the first couple you can chapters. You just say I'm dumb. Just, just you're say not, not dumb. You're it. just ill-informed and inexperienced, <laughs> and I'm here to help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> so... The story of the Shahnameh starts almost at the beginning of time when people were still living in caves and the earth is very new at this time. You've got people roaming around, you've got animals roaming around, and you also have demons and fairies and all these other mythical creatures all just wandering around and sharing the earth together. And they all of them have interactions with each other too. Like a big old peaceful magical thing i don't know about peaceful when i say interactions that doesn't always mean they have good interactions oh. so you know there's strife as you do um but there was no real civilization so the first person to bring civilization about 
was the first king of Persia called Kiyumaz. Try it. No, no, thank you. Okay, Ki. Ki. You. You. Maz. Ma. Ers. Kiyumaz. 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 There you go. That's close enough. Kiyumaz. <laughs> So Kiyomaz lived in the mountains in caves. He and his people, they wore leopard skins because metal has not been discovered yet or no one's learned how to use metal to make anything else. So they just have leopard skins as their clothing. They, this is their basics at the moment. They have not invented anything else. Mm -hmm. So the things that Kiyomaz is known for kind of bringing to people and bringing to society. First, he's the one who decides I'm going to be the king of everything and i'm going to set order for everyone he taught his people how to prepare food and how to make clothes out of animal hides so he's like hey guys we should put some salt on this food i bet it'll taste better after that Ooh. so uh yeah back in the day when you kind of just scavenge for what you had he's the one who said hey let's start doing different things to our foods to make it taste better but you know, it's clear that they were already hunting animals. If they were using animal hides for skins, mm -hmm. then they must have used their meat for eating. But he might have just kind of told them, this is how we're going to prepare the food. This is how we're going to serve the food. And kind of getting us out of that caveman mindset that we had. Kind of a slow migration out of being just basically animals yourselves. Pretty much. A lot of these beginning kings are, their big contributions are setting up the basic ideas of society and what separates us from animals. Put on these skins. You look <laughs> ugly. Quit wandering around <laughs> naked with no fur. I wouldn't go so far as to say he did that. But, so, a lot of the kings in the book, they're going to have a sign that they're blessed by Ahura Mazda. They're going to have this halo of divinity around their head. So it's like they they have some sort of glow about their head like or something. A, a glowing space helmet. That's what it looks like in the pop-up book. Uh, you know what? It's not a space helmet. The it's aliens. just some glow. You know how you see the pictures of angels that they got the halo of glow around them? Oh. It's like that. So kind of it's like... It's a halo. Kind of like those paintings of Jesus and all that from, like, the Renaissance. Yeah, they, they kind of stole that from Persians. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they noticed, hey, the Persians got this going on in their art to show divinity. We're going to do that, too. Mm -hmm. So We invented it, though. It was there first. <laughs> I'm not going to fight over that. But, so... Kiyomaz has the halo of divinity around him. Shows that he is blessed by Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda approves of what he's doing. And he's a good guy. So besides him giving all these contributions to people and bringing them together, he has this son called Siamak. And oh my gosh, does he love this kid so much. Uh, he, he's, he's a grown kid. But it, the book talks about how whenever he's with Siamak, he's like the happiest man ever. And when Siamak is away off doing something like, bye, dad, I'll see you later, he is so depressed. We like to call this a clingy parent. Yeah, this sounds familiar. This sounds like my mom. The traditional ancient uh, helicopter parent. <laughs> I guess Persians invented that too. <laughs> So, of course, when all these good things are happening, evil isn't going to sit around and let it slide. So, we're going to now introduce the, the Ahriman. dark, slippery, evil things. Like how in the, the Garden of Eden, happened. everything was going good for Adam and Eve. And Satan's like, nah. Got to come in and ruin it somehow. Ahriman sees all the good things that Kiyomaris is doing. And all the glory that he's bringing to Ahura Mazda, and how handsome and wonderful that his son is, and it's like, man, th this guy is good. His heir is going to do just as good of a job. This is a problem. I am kind of losing a lot of my evilness in this area because they're kind of bringing order to things. So he sends his own son who is described as this black, wolf-like demon Ooh, called Khazuran. 
Hazuran is planning to go and attack the kingdom and specifically Siamak. Because you take down Siamak, Kiyomaris is not going to do so well. Now, Ahura Mazda has his own agents out there. In particular, he has this angel called Surush. Surush shows up a lot in the Shahnameh, Ahmed, but this is like the first time you see him. He gets word of Khazaran's plans. Surush goes and he tells Siamak about the attack that's coming towards him, and Siamak's like, that's no problem, I can do this. So he and his army go out there to face Khazaran and his army. Um, you remember what I said about how they only have leopard skins? Uh-huh, are there no leopards left? No, no, there's plenty of leopards still. Good. Um, but I want you to consider what might happen to a person who goes out onto the battlefield in animal hide. And they they that's probably it. get stuck real easily by spears and stuff. Stuck by spears, except there's no spears at the time. However, there are demon claws and demon teeth. And Khazaran had no problem taking Siamak down as a result. Oof. He went down real good. Wait, were these just people fighting with their bare hands? And people and animals fighting with their bare hands, sticks, stones. They hadn't invented weapons yet at the time. Ah. Caveman style fight. So it's like an army of bears against just some dudes who are running around there basically naked. Pretty much, but also remember that when I'm saying armies, I'm not just talking about people. There are animals too. Oh. Animals do have, a, they, they kind of connect with and communicate with us a little bit more in the earlier times of our history, according to the Shah Nameh. So there are animals going out there to fight as well. Okay, so wolves and ba slightly smaller bears, I guess. Whatever they had, it was not enough because Siamak was thrown to the ground and gored to death by Khazuran. So we're about to witness some major tears. And I mean major. The Shana Meg gets pretty intense with its weeping scenes. And so when Kiyomars hears of his son's death, to say he's beside himself is an understatement. He's described as, as falling down from his throne and sobbing and beating himself over the head and scratching his face until he's bloody. And this goes on for days. Wow. He is a crying, ridiculous mess. It's, uh, it's intense. So. I have no words. I have no words either. It's, um. I don't think, I, I. I, I'm not a parent myself. I can't imagine that happening to me. I can't imagine being so overcome with grief to the point that I am mutilating myself yeah. to try and deal with the... With the, the pain of loss. Yeah. And it kind of makes me think of that one line from Lord of the Rings where he says, no parent should have to bury their child. Mm. And when you think about that, the natural order of things is that we're supposed to see the passing of our own parents it shouldn't be vice versa and to for it to be your only son and the thing that makes you the happiest in the world to be taken from you in such a brutal way mm. i can imagine it does something terrible to you this is also like this story takes place towards the beginning of the world yes when people and animals and whole concepts are kind of new this is like kind of almost a story of the first true grief ever felt by this kind of divine power i i know sia mac and his dad are, are human of course but in a way they're they're kind of like these little divine touched people their grief is new and the first of its kind and it's the exact kind of evil that Ahiman was looking for. I would also say that it's the first grief brought by war. Mm, that too. This is the first really big the first war. war story. It's the first battle. It's the first war story and it's the first major death that comes from war. And it's probably not just Kiyo Mars. Kiyo Mars. Kiyo Mars, who's feeling this. It's all the people who lost somebody. It is, and I'm glad that she brought that up because the story does say that Kiyo Mars wasn't the only one grieving. 
animals are grieving, people are grieving, everyone is devastated by the loss of Siamak because he was supposed to be the heir and the one continuing this glory. So the mourning goes on for an entire year. Everyone is mourning. Everyone is uh, really stricken by this. And the, the armies and the animals all across the kingdom, they all went into mourning. And here's something interesting that the book mentioned. It said that people wore blue to represent their mourning. As like a grief color? As a grief color. So, which is interesting because in modern day Iran, people wear black. And a lot, even in our Western culture, we wear black as a sign of mourning. But that blue as a sign of mourning in here is kind of interesting. And I wonder if it was that way until maybe more modern influences came into Iran and changed the color to, to black. Blue kind of makes sense as a grieving color. It's kind of a sorrowful color. It's a. It's a also a peaceful things. color, yeah. too. It's a comforting color. Mm -hmm. it, it evokes, like, images of heaven and stuff like that. That's true. I didn't think about that. Um, so, yeah, makes me wonder about if there's anyone who still... Uh, uses blue as a sign of mourning or not. I wouldn't be entirely surprised. I, from what I understand, that color can change a lot depending on the culture you're in. Oh, yeah. After a year of mourning, Surush comes back. The angel Surush comes back and tells Kiyomaz, okay, that's enough mourning. You need to get up and you need to defeat Hazuran because he is creating too much power for Ahriman now. So he does as he's told, and he begins to build up armies. But he's also getting too old to lead the armies to war at this point. He's an old man at this point. He cannot go into war. So he begins to train and prepare his grandson, Hushang, who is who was the son of Siamak. Hushang has just as much of a need to take down Hazuran as his yeah. grandfather does. So and the good thing about Hushang is he is just as smart and as skilled as his father. So he continues on and he says, yes, I'm going to help take him down. I'm going to lead these armies. And he undergoes training as well. So he and his armies. Montage starts now. Montage starts. You must fight more, Hushang. You must unlock your true potential. <laughs> Don't you want to avenge your father? Cue the anime yeah. montage. <laughs> Let's have several flashbacks to the moment that Siamak was taken down. Yeah. Thank you, anime. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, anime. Thank you, Rocky. Um, but in a lot of ways, Hu Shang starts really taking the place of Siamak in, in Kiyomaru's eyes. And he's like, if I can get Hu Shang to ascend the throne, and if I can get Hu Shang to attain this victory, then I will be doing right by my son. Now, let me describe this army. This army is filled not only with people, but also animals like lions and tigers and wolves. Oh my! And birds. Birds are in there too. Oh good. And That's fairies. 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 Like literally what I'm thinking of? It the says the word wingy. fairies. Now I don't know if we're talking Cornish pixies or Tinkerbells, but there are fairies involved. I have never seen a picture of a Persian fairy, so I don't know. Fairy's got to be like a translation or something, like something close. Maybe. Fairy can mean a lot of things, even in like Western folklore. It could be. I'm going to say this. If any of our listeners knows what a Persian fairy is supposed to be, please email us and let us know about that. Because we would like to learn what on earth is going on here. I want I want a description of the fairies that were in Hushang's army. I bet it's like a word for like a, a, a spirit of some sort. Maybe it is. Like the spirit, like the little bad house spirits that you're supposed to chase out by spring cleaning. <laughs> Maybe so. Um, but regardless, the fairies are involved. So this mishmash oh, no. of people... They, they go to war against the demons and Hazran. And Hushang, here's interesting. Hushang is described as having grabbed the demon in a strong grip and cleaving his body in two and severing his head. Then he skinned the demon. There's a problem with that. 
Can you notice the problem with that description? Um, How did he do it? With his, with the might of his punches? Maybe. His flesh hands? Metal work hadn't been invented yet, so he didn't have an axe or a sword. Did he have claws? I don't think, Hushang is a human. He did not have claws. Well, I figured that was the twist here. I'm going to argue that, it, the book doesn't describe it, but I'm going to argue that Hushang was so angry he did it with his own bare hands. Just cut this guy's... I think he was just that angry with Khazuran. His... You killed my father. Prepare mad... to die. <laughs> he had built his body to be a blade. Hey, again, anime montage. Yeah. <laughs> he just steal when chopped his head off. He, he learned something pretty intense. Enough to, with his bare hands, cleave a demon in two, behead him, and then skin him. Now, I imagine the skinning part, if the body's already down, you just take a rock and hack it off at that yeah, point. Yeah, people have been skinning. I mean, like, they had to make those pelts somehow. Yeah. So maybe it was a really good stone axe? Oh, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> Either way, whatever happens, however he does it, Hushang and his army win the day, and Kiyomars is kind of comes to the point of, I have done my duty to my people. I have done my duty to my fallen son Siamak. I am ready to go. And he passes away peacefully. It is said that his reign lasted for 30 years. Ooh. And of course, after that, Husheng is the one who becomes the second king. So one of the first things that Husheng does as king is that he establishes a system of justice throughout the land as per the will of Ahura Mazda. Laying down the law. Laying down the law. He's like, you know what? This crazy business with the armies and the demons wouldn't have happened if we had a little bit more justice around you know instead of laws for everybody to follow so he sets that up which is you know that's important but that's not what Hushank is known best for uh one day he and his men are riding their horses down a path and they see something slithering between the rocks um at first the description that they gave it i thought it was just a snake but the book describes it having eyes like pools of blood and smoke coming out of its mouth. So at the very least, it was either a snake who found some salsa, and at most it was a demon. Don't salsa know. Snake. It's a salsa snake. Uh, Hushang sees it, picks up a rock, and throws it as hard as he can, and he misses. <laughs> but the rock hit the other rocks and caused some sparks. And those sparks fell on some dry twigs and leaves that were nearby the rocks and created fire. Oh, he invented fire. He discovered fire. He, they had never seen fire before, but yes, this is the story, the Persian version of how man found fire. Who shang threw a rock at a snake, it missed. That's probably not that different from how it actually happened. Probably not. It's pretty accurate. It's not like the Native American story of the crow bringing fire back from from, from the, the creation sun. god. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a really cool story in and of, of itself. But this one does sound a little bit more accurate. I can see someone riding along. We're like, ah, a snake. Kill it. Throws the rock. Misses the snake entirely because the snake is like, hey, I'm just slithering here. <laughs> Does the snake come back as, like, a character later? Nope. They just saw a weird-looking animal. <laughs> he said, I'm going to kill it with a rock. Missed entirely. That's the most redneck thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you see that snake over there? I bet I can kill it. <laughs> Watch. What's really happening to those leaves? <laughs> You know, I wonder if Hushang's companions were giving him a hard time about uh, missing the snake. He's like, wait, 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 what's that warm stuff? Ooh, let's look at this instead. Ignore the fact that I missed hitting the snake. <laughs> I can make fire. But anyways, everyone gets excited in the crowd around it because this is, of course, the discovery of fire. They've never seen it before. Um, they drank all night and they celebrated around the fire. And Hushang saw it as a sign and a gift from God. So he gave thanks to God for it. And this ties into a part of Zoroastrian religion. They hold fire to be a sacred thing. Mm. So whether Hushang is the one who found it or not, a lot of people say fire came from God. It, 
it's a sign of God, and that's why it's so important. Uh, when we talk about Noruz in another episode, you're going to notice that fire is going to come up again. So, Char Shambe Suri, you remembered it. So the first night, that first night, they celebrated the discovery of fire. That was the night that Hushan created a special holiday called Sade. It celebrated 50 days before the first day of spring. Um, but I don't know how common it is today. I actually tried asking my mom about this holiday. And, of course, she grew up in Iran. She had no experience celebrating it. Uh, if any listeners out there do celebrate Sade, I would love to know what you guys do and how you celebrate it. Uh, I know that Persians will take any reason that they can to throw a party. So maybe you and I can start celebrating Sade, yeah. but I'd like to learn the traditions you around keep that. Track of all these holidays. The only ones that I really celebrate are Noruz and Shabe Yalda. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two. But man, there's a lot of other ancient holidays and I would love to get into those too. So besides fire being a good thing to party around and keep yourselves warm, Husheng then discovers, ah, I can take metal out of rocks and I can melt it into different things and I can use it. And he creates different weapons and different tools. And honestly, I bet his dad wished he had learned that secret way earlier <laughs> in time. Probably would have made some things easier. See how Mac is rolling in his grave, like, I could have used that! Well, Shang is just like, this would have made carving that demon in half a little easier. <laughs> Didn't have to get so much blood I under my fingernails. Blades. I have my own hands. <laughs> That's the biggest thing that Hu Shang is known for, is those... Cutting a demon in half with his hands. No, finding fire. I think the second one was cleaving a demon in half with his <laughs> bare hands. When he was a kid. We're, we're assuming that that's what he did. The book really doesn't go into details, so... Um, but he does some other things, too. He also helped progressing the irrigation of fields and the overall agriculture of the land so it was easier for people to grow and harvest food. So farms really grew up thanks to how Husheng told people to design them. He helped separate the animals into the ones that were going to be wild and the ones that we could domesticate. And, uh... He's got to pick. You know... He's got the divine halo around him. Yeah, whatever he's deciding is God's will. So, you know, uh, just follow whatever he says. If Adam got to name the animals, Hushang gets to say which ones we hunt and which ones we... These are the delicious animals, and these are the ones that'll bite your toes off. <laughs> Honestly, they'll all bite our toes off. Have you seen our cats? <laughs> uh, he also helped people kind of perfect their hunting abilities as well, which kind of makes sense with him creating all these new tools and all these new weapons. He is going to find ways to perfect hunting. Um, Hushang eventually died of old age. I think his reign was about 40 years. And he, the next to ascend the throne was his son, Tamurez. But we will save the story of Tamurez for episode three. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be where we conclude our Shaname session of the day. We've talked about, we, we've brought up like... Um angels and demons and gods and, yeah uh i think that's as good a time as any to to talk about zoroastrianism so you're right this would be a good time for us to talk about zoroastrianism and the word that i'm using is what we use here in the west but in iran they call it zardoshtian i didn't know that <laughs> yeah so of course you know we're not going to have the same you know words that you guys use it's kind of the same with you guys call it persepolis we call it prespolis so, that's a greek word we'll get to that later though huh yeah so uh, zoroastrianism isn't just like I, I figured it wasn't pronounced that way but i figured yeah. it was all, the right word to use just kind of spelled more in english I would, I would guess so. I'm not sure where the word Zoroastrianism came from, but I know in Iran we call it Zardoshtian. It's the people who follow Zardosht, who is the man, Zoroaster, or the man who found it. Zarathustra, yeah. He's the one who kind of brought the religion to people. So this is a very ancient religion, but it's not even the oldest one. Because 
it was the very first religion that pronounced that there's only one God. Before then, everyone was believing in multiple gods. And even in this area, before it was even Persia, this area believed in multiple gods as well. So here comes um, Zardosht. I'm sorry. His, I know his Persian name a lot better. I'm just going to call him Zardosht. He comes along and he tells people there's only one God, Ahura Mazda. And, of course, then he talks about the e evil one being Ahriman. The really cool thing is that he kind of appropriates a lot of the old gods of the ancient religions and they become sort of angels or demons or other spiritual beings. And I think Christianity did this in Ireland too, right? Right. They did that with um, kind of their old gods, these multiple disparate gods from different regions of Ireland uh, became st stories of fairies and heroes conquering armies and uh, people fighting against evil. Just these abnormally strong heroes. And it, the same thing kind of happened here. So uh, Zardosht kind of started his religion about 1800 to 1500 BC. He created this sacred text called the Avesta. Uh, Ahura Mazda is the one who controls good and the right way of living and the creation of things. And Ahriman is, of course, the opposite of that, the opposing force to him. So it's very dual. It's a very dualistic religion. Believes in opposite forces, good against evil, and there's always a balance Light between the darkness, two. Darkness, order, and chaos. Yes. The interesting thing is, is that Ahriman, in some ways, isn't necessarily evil. He's just the opposite. You must have a a balance of both. An opposite uh, to good is bad. Opposite to light is darkness. You can't have one without the other. The sacred text that has all the scripture for Zoroastrianism is called the Avesta. I have not read it myself. I only know a few things about it. It wasn't originally written in Persian, is that right? There used to be a culture and a language called Avesta, right? I believe so. I'm not too sure on that. But I do know that this this religion is older than than Persia. It okay. was around before Persia was a country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it had to have been written in another language besides Persian. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Latin versus the Bible being written in Latin versus the people who it was being preached to. Yes. Speaking French and English and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So here's some of the basic things that I've known that I've learned about. One of them is really interesting enough. This religion was against slavery. Mm. Said so you you should not own another human being. When you die in Zoroastrian religion, they believe that your soul is weighed. If you have good thoughts and good words and good deeds and they outweigh your bad thoughts and your bad words and your bad deeds, you will go to heaven. Otherwise, uh, you will go to hell. Their, their version of hell. Mm. Um, if you're in Zoroastrian religion, you're not required to congregate. You know how in Christianity and in Islam, you have to go to church or to mosque, you know, a few times a week or once a week or so. You're not required to congregate in Zoroastrian religion. Uh, but there are fire temples for public worship. What? Fire temples. You remember how Hushan found that fire and everyone's like, ooh, is it a sign of God? The temples in Zoroastrian religion have fire, usually an everlasting, a, a fire that kind of burns for a long time. And one of the things that they do is they tend it and they keep it alive for years and years and years and years. Cool. Super a cool. fire temple? Fire temples. Wouldn't you love to be like, yeah, I'm going to go worship at the fire temple. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the fire altar is meant to burn eternally. The fire altar. Fire altar. Yeah. And the fire temple. There's all of these like special rituals and such that you do around the fire. We even do special rituals uh, for Noruz and stuff that has to do with fire. Oh, the jumping over fire? We will jump over fires in order to burn away the bad luck and also to... Uh, Get rid of those fairies. <laughs> I didn't say the fairies were bad. <laughs> And it burns away your bad luck and also uh, gives you good luck. Mm. And also on the special table that we set up, we also have candles. 
Fire is very important in Zoroastrian religion. Some of the holidays do include Noruz and Yalda, Shabbat Yalda. They have a holy city in Iran called Yazd. Modern yes. priests, they have modern priests. They can be uh, low ranking that only do like rituals in the outer courtyard. They help the higher priests. You've got some that do the greater rituals in the temple. You've got the higher levels that they will read the Avesta and they'll perform any rituals that you need. Fire clerics, really. Fire clerics. <laughs> um, they'll perform low-level uh, spell casting services for a modest gold fee. You're turning this into a Dungeons and Dragons thing. <laughs> well, you're the one talking about fire temples and fire altars. You know what would be kind of cool is if at some point you did like a Dungeons and Dragons campaign that was based off of like Persian stuff and Zoroastrian stuff. Well, then um, you guys would spend all your time at the fire temple. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's an interesting thing. It's how they deal with dead bodies. They burn them. No. No? No, you don't put a dead body in something sacred like fire. Oh. Ew. Gross. Try again. Throw it in the ocean. Water is also sacred to the Zoroastrians. Well, you can't put it in the water either. You'll contaminate the water. That's sacred and holy and people drink out of that. You dump it in the hole in the ground. The ground is also sacred. <laughs> Try again. You eat it? <laughs> Your no! family eats it? Dead bodies are considered to be possessed by evil. Ooh. Which is not a bad way of thinking about it. If you think about back in the day, a decomposing body could have a lot of diseases and stuff that can affect people around you. So um, I don't blame them for saying, nah, the dead body is evil. Just and don't touch it. Don't touch it. Here's what they would do. Don't eat it. They, Because you can't keep it in your homes. Let it contaminate fire or earth. You can't put it in the ground. So they build these tall, tall altars. And they put them on top of the altars in the open air. And they're left there to be picked away by scavenging birds. That's how you deal with your bodies. In the Zoroastrian religion. Oh, so you just leave all the evil spirits to the birds? The birds are considered God's creatures and they're gonna oh, handle the birds their are body. sacred too. Birds are not sacred. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd have bird temples. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the fire temple, the water temple, the earth temple, and the bird, the bird temple. <laughs> You walk into the bird temple, and there's birds. There's just birds everywhere. You know, in That's Harry where Potter. We keep the birds. In Harry Potter, they had their own bird temple. They like to call it the Owlery. <laughs> hey, bird. I've, I've got a dead body. So, we can laugh about it all we want, but this is a religion that people still have. Oh, right. Yeah, this is still a religion that's lasting, but it is dying. Because several things. First of all, uh,. Zoroastrianism was doing good and well in the Persian region until Islam came around. So a lot of a lot of the Zoroastrians actually fled to India and they settled there. They actually created their own community and they are known as Parsis. Fun fact, Freddie Mercury, his family came from India and they were Zoroastrians. Oh. They were Parsis. Was Freddie Mercury a practicer? I don't know if he was a practicer, but um, one of the really cool things is, you know, that new movie of his came out recently mm -hmm. um, oh, called Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody. Rhapsody. Yeah. And they actually reference a really popular saying in Zoroastrianism. His father tells him, you know, about good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And I thought it was really cool that they left that in there. I don't know if Freddie Mercury himself followed it very religiously. Yeah. He mostly lived for the rock and roll, but he did come from that family. Mm. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting that they left that in there. I was glad they left that in there. That that might have made me tear up a little bit. Also, uh, this might be a good time to tell you that <laughs> something that Iranians tend to do is if anyone does anything famous, we claim them as our own. <laughs> so my mother is like, oh, you know why... Uh, Freddie Mercury was so good at his music and his uh, lyrics writing. It's because he's Persian. It's like, Mama, and he's not Persian. It's like, he's Zoroastrian. That's Persian. It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Let her have it. Let her have that one. So going back to kind of the goals for the Zoroastrians, you need to be born a Zoroastrian. You need to marry a Zoroastrian. If you marry someone who's not Zoroastrian, you cannot be Zoroastrian. And your children cannot be Zoroastrian. Very inclusive. Very inclusive. But unfortunately, and they do not accept converts. You cannot convert to Zoroastrianism. Mm. You have to be born to Zoroastrian by two Zoroastrian parents. So as a result, this religion is slowly dying. It's, there's, there's not many people of this religion anymore, which is really, really sad. It's, um, I'm really, you know, I'm glad that it's still around and whatnot to this day. And there's a lot of really good and pure ways of seeing the world. And it just kind of makes me sad. This religion is, is dying as it is. Mm. But sometimes I wish that they would change their, their, their stance policy. and let people convert. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a sect of some sort that thinks that kind of ruling is a little ridiculous. Yeah, but also we are outsiders. This isn't our religion. Exactly. It so might it, be more it might be more of a safety thing mm -hmm. than a religious thing. And it might be the way that they want this to be. It's yeah. You know, we, we can sit here and speculate all we, we want, but it's not our religion. And exactly. at the end of the day, we need to just leave it be and let them do what they feel is right for them. Exactly. They really focus on living a righteous life. You work for the betterment of the world through, through small acts, through personal acts. The whole, you know, you start by having good thoughts in your head and focusing on the good thoughts in your mind. That helps you. Having good words, that helps you spread good to the people around you. Making good deeds, that can change an even greater spectrum. But it starts with the good thoughts in your head. I think especially in this day and age where a lot of us feel, you and me, we feel a lot of anxiety. About the way the world is and the evil in the world. Not just that, but also just about ourselves and our personal lives and who we are as people. We sometimes get really down on ourselves mm. and... Then, of course, like you said, the way that the world is right now, we get down about the world. But if we focus on giving ourselves good thoughts, then that helps us change for the better. Then when we have good words, we encourage each other and the people around us for the better. And good deeds kind of proceeds from there. And that's such a powerful and simple way to look at it all. Mm. That it starts from your inner circle and goes out from there. Yeah. It's probably one of my favorite things about Zoroastrianism is that line. It's a nice way to think about things. They do also believe that uh, the wicked will be cleansed of sins on the day of judgment and will be allowed to come to heaven after that. Mm. So even those who when you were weighed and you had bad thoughts, bad words and bad deeds, well, you're just going to be there until the day of judgment. And then everyone's going to get to go to heaven. You gotta sit there and think about it for a little while. <laughs> sit there and think about what you've done. Okay, you're out of timeout. You can come over here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, they believe that happiness and optimism is good, and it's the be the best way to get it is to bring it to other people. Again, a lot of just that internal. You find righteousness in yourself, then you bring it to other people. Uh, and you get it by helping other people as well. It's, I just, it's such a religion of positivity and thinking positive and spreading positivity in order to receive it yourself. Mm. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the symbol that they have. You have seen this symbol before. The Farvahar. Yes, the Farvahar. It's also called the Furuha. The, the little bird man. And you have seen me wearing this symbol and i think i right. gave you the i wear symbol. the symbol too yeah so if you look it up you might also see it being called the farvahar and as soon as you look at it well when you saw it what did you think it was what did i think it meant no what did it look like to you when you saw it oh it looks like a little ring with some wings coming out of it and a man coming out of the ring holding some stuff the first time you looked at it you said what's with this bird man 
Do you not remember this? I've, I've said Birdman too much. You have already. called it a Birdman. This episode has involved too many birds. Well, we're going to cut out some. <laughs> no, we're not cutting there out any bird action. There you go. You were worried about the bird temple. We don't need a bird temple. We got a bird man. <laughs> yeah, he represents the whole thing. <laughs> Brings it all He's together. He's going to come eat all your dead bodies. So if you look really closely... <laughs> <laughs> This man. You're really attached to these birds. <laughs> this man's gonna swoop down. No, that's not how it works. He's a... It's not a vulture. Oh, this one's got lots of color to it. It looks just like uh, a legendary Pokemon bird. Oh my god. If I ever find out that Pokemon has taken anything from Persian culture in any way, I'm going to lay an egg. So, if you look at the Farbahar, or the furu hat. You look really closely at it. You see a little man. And he's holding a little ring in his hand. And he's got the other hand pointing up. So the ring that he's holding. Is kind of the promise of loyalty and faithfulness. And kind of man uh, a symbol of men should not break their promises. People should not break their promises. If you love it then you should have put a ring on it. <laughs> and I guess I put a ring on you, husband. This is what I got to deal with. The hand pointing up is kind of saying uh, we should always look towards the heavens for, for guidance and for seeking a good path. The man himself, you'll notice, has a beard on him. It's supposed to show that he is old. Uh, he... The old age kind of says, consult those who are experienced and wise people. There's wisdom in old age. There's also, uh, the man represents that you have the free will to choose. Men have free will. You get to make this choice of doing good or doing evil. Um, the wings themselves are separated into three sections, and they are the good thoughts, the good words, the good deeds. Um... They're all coming out of this circle, and the man is also coming out of this circle. A circle, of course, has no beginning or end. This circle represents the cycle of life, the eternity of the universe, but also the human spirit in that any action that you perform is going to come back around to you. Basically, what goes around comes, comes around. around. What goes around comes around. It's the old Zoroastrian saying. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Sounds a little too much like karma. <laughs> the <laughs> the three tail feathers, the tail feathers are separated into three parts. They are the bad thoughts, the bad words, the bad deeds. That's why they come out of the butt, right? Oh my god, Jesus, why? <laughs> You're making me invoke Jesus' name while I'm talking about another religion. Stop this! Okay. One last thing. You see these two kind of unfurling ribbons coming out? I thought those were legs. <laughs> oh, God, Seth, why are legs. you doing this to me? Sarah, I didn't know those were ribbons. This They're the ribbons! Place. Have you seen bird legs that look like that? I thought they were stylized. They're ribbons. One of them is the good mind, and the other one is the angry mind. The angry mind. Ah. Uh... Right? That'd do it right. Good job. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. I'm done here. <laughs> I don't know what else to do with you, husband. I'm just, you know what? Good thoughts. Good words. Good deeds. Good thoughts. Good well, thoughts. Folks, I need the good That concludes our episode for today. <laughs> Next time on Mazandercast, we will discuss. Oh, I think we'll discuss the next couple of kings in the Shah Nameh. We're going to talk about Tamurez. And we're then gonna we're going to talk, talk about Noruz. <laughs> and we're also going to talk about Jamshid, the king who helped us invent Noruz. Yeah. I am really looking forward to next episode because Noruz is one of my favorite holidays. It's going to be great. Want to keep up with us? You can follow us on Twitter at Mazandercast. That's M-A-Z-A-N-D-E-R-C-A-S-T. We will announce the next episode through our Twitter, so spread the word. And we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions on current and future episodes. If there's any topics you'd like us to cover or stories you want to share with us, then email us at mazandercast at gmail.com. Spelled same as the Twitter handle. Yes. 
A uh, special thanks to Dr. Lin for our cover art. Check out more of her work at LorraineLin.com. That's L-O-R-R-A-I-N-E-L-I-N.com. We thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope you'll stick around for...